Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God. And let us pray. Good and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for gathering us here in this place to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed. Heavenly Father, thank you for a beautiful day you've given to us and thank you for this word we will hear from Luke chapter 22. I ask, O Lord, that you would anoint my tongue to clearly declare this message, and we pray that it might be from you and a blessing from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. On Thursday of Holy Week, we read through Luke chapter 22 and 23. But there wasn't a message connected to those chapters. We simply read through the text, and that was our message. I mentioned at the time that we would go back to these chapters to cover them more in depth. There are points to be made for which I have had questions, and for which I have not done the research on them until now. So let's begin. Luke 22, verse 1, we read, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, meaning Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and confirmed, conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him. To betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Now, we don't know much about Judas other than what we have in the scriptures. Okay, so this passage lets us know that he was numbered among the twelve disciples. He wasn't part of the inner circle, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, but he was one of the twelve. So this means that Jesus chose him to be one of his disciples, and wherever Jesus went, that's where Judas went. Judas saw up close the miracles. He heard what Jesus taught. When Jesus sent out the disciples, Judas was sent out to go do the ministry that Jesus would have them do. Heal the sick, cast out demons, and so forth. Nevertheless, Judas was going to be the one to betray Jesus. Why? Well, we aren't really given the reason why he would do such a thing. This passage tells us that Satan entered Judas, and that's when Judas went to the religious authorities. Would Judas have betrayed Jesus had Satan not entered him? We don't know. What we do know is what we know from John's Gospel. John wrote that Judas was a thief. And he used to have responsibility for the money box Jesus and the disciples had. But John records for us that he would take money out of the money box which people put into it. Now that money box that Jesus and the disciples had, I'm sure it had plenty of uses, but probably the biggest use was everyday living. So that they could buy food and so forth as they traveled around. They had benefactors. They had a lot of women that actually helped them too. But this money box probably was part of that. Not to mention the fact that, you know, if they saw somebody in need, they probably took out a money box to help that person in need. We, We don't really know, but they had a money box. And Judas was in charge, and Judas would take out of that money box what people had put into it. So... What do you think Satan is seeing? He is the one who prowls around looking for people to devour. And he could see that Judas could be played. And so as the religious leaders pondered how they might destroy Jesus, Satan had seen that Judas had an open door into his spirit which Satan could exploit. And so he did exploit that door and entered Judas through it. 
The text tells us that once Satan entered Judas, Judas went out immediately to the religious leaders, telling them that he could deliver Jesus to them. For such a prize, the religious leaders would give Judas money, and money was at least one of Judas's weaknesses. And so Judas agreed, and the deal to betray Jesus was struck. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room. There, make ready. So they found it just as he said, had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, if I would have been part of the disciples at that point, I would have done what I had probably done earlier, a week earlier, is the disciples probably would have marveled as they prepared for the Passover feast, because once again, Jesus knew exactly what was going on. You're going to meet a guy who is carrying a water jug, follow him into the house, say to the master of the house, where is the room? And they probably would have just simply marveled as they prepared for the Passover meal. Our God is amazing. Verse 14. When the hour had come, he, Jesus, sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus, in verse 15 He didn't actually say, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The word fervent has been added by the translators. It's not part of the original text. The text actually reads, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With desire, I have desired. Well, that's kind of strange wording to us, okay? It's what is known as a Hebraism, or a Hebrew idiom or expression. The wording is meant to emphasize Jesus' desire to eat this particular Passover meal with his disciples. So in order to make Jesus' earnest desire to eat this Passover with his disciples, the translators added the word fervent in order to make it clear that he really, really, really desired to eat this particular Passover with his disciples. Now I'm sure you also notice that twice Jesus has pointed to the not eating this meal or drinking of the fruit of the vine until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God or until it is until the kingdom of God comes. What is he talking about? Well, when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying that the will of God would be fulfilled here on earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. We also pray that the kingdom of God would come and reign among us just as the kingdom reigns in heaven. We pray this... Because we desire it to come into the world because the world is at enmity with God. The world is full of sin and rebellion and evil and wickedness of all kinds. When Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God with him into the earth realm. The world was full of darkness. The Son of God comes and brings the kingdom of God with him, that kingdom of light. Okay? 
John the Baptist could say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand because God's son was now present in the earth. Jesus would say the same thing. His disciples would say the same thing when they went out to minister. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God was at hand since Jesus was in the earth. But there's more to it than simply Jesus appearing on the scene. Okay? And the more to it is that he had work to do. He had work to do. He had to suffer. He specifically had to fulfill what the Passover pointed to. The Passover that was given to God's people way back 1,450 years earlier pointed to Jesus. And so you've got to fulfill what that Passover was talking about. Passover... It was the first of the feasts that God had commanded Israel to observe yearly. Now Israel knew it as the remembrance of their deliverance by God from Egyptian captivity. In the process of delivering Israel from Egyptian bondage, God also judged Egypt's gods. Each of the ten plagues was God's judgment against the specific god or goddess of Egypt. The last and the greatest plague, the death of the firstborn among the Egyptians, was a judgment against Pharaoh himself, whom the Egyptians considered a god. In fact, they considered him the son of the sun god Ra. That's a strike slap in the face of our god. But Pharaoh wasn't a god. We know that. The Egyptians apparently didn't, but we know that. He wasn't a god, and so he could do nothing to protect the firstborn among the Egyptians and all the animals the Egyptians had, any more than he could prevent any of the other plagues. But God could, and he did protect his own people as the Lord passed over Egypt on that first Passover, or on that Passover. He protected his people while he destroyed the firstborn of man and beast among the Egyptians. From the night of the first Passover to the night Jesus shared the Passover before his betrayal with his disciples, Israel had been remembering how God had brought them out of slavery. Here, however, when Jesus says, I desire to, I really desire to have this Passover with you, share this Passover with you, he's pointing to a greater slavery. He's pointing to the slavery of all mankind, the slavery of sin. You know, we, of course, entered into slavery when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had one command, and they blew it. And the effects of their sin was immediate. And from that point on, sin filled the earth, and we see it now. It's terrible. And so God sent his son. We know this story. We know it well. He sent his own dear son to be the Passover lamb we needed so that God's judgment against sin would pass over us and land on his son. He bore the judgment because he bore the sin that we had committed. He accomplished what we could not accomplish. He died so that we could live forever in the presence of the Heavenly Father. Now, Jesus was, of course, about to accomplish all of this when he stated that he would no longer eat of that particular Passover or drink of that fruit of the vine. When he says that, he was bringing to a close, closing the book on what the Passover meant from the beginning. He was bringing it to an end because now it was going to mean something different. Jesus eagerly desired to eat this particular Passover because a new Passover was being opened, not to just Israel, but to the entire world. No longer were God's people to remember when God brought them out of Egyptian bondage. Now everyone is to remember what Jesus was going to do for them by bringing them out of the bondage of sin and death. 
So having brought the meaning of the first Passover to a close, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Israel had remembered what God had done for them in Egypt. Now the bread of Passover had new meaning. Now the bread of Passover is Jesus' own body. When the disciples and any believer in Jesus, after Jesus' sacrifice, ate of this bread, they were to remember Jesus. See, a new chapter was opening. Now at this point, Jesus' disciples don't understand that Jesus is going to die on a Roman cross. But Jesus knew. And whenever they were to eat this meal, formally remembering what God had done for them in Egypt, now they remember what Jesus would do. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus specifically states that the cup of wine, which Israel knew as the cup of redemption, was being given a new meaning. At Mount Sinai, God had made a covenant with Israel. For their part, Israel would keep God's commands and be obedient. That's what they covenanted to do. That's what they promised to do. We know how well they did that, but that's not for now, this particular message. At Mount Sinai, they had brought together sacrifices. Half of the blood of the sacrifices Israel offered was sprinkled on the altar. The other half, Moses sprinkled on the people. Telling them that this was the blood of the covenant that the Lord had just made with them. But when Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, the cup that we know is the cup of redemption, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The blood of bulls, the blood of goats, was making way for the blood which Jesus would shed early the next morning. Early the next morning, meaning 9 o'clock in the morning at the time of the morning sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was going to supersede the morning and the evening sacrifices as we have learned. Because we know from scriptures that Jesus, his sacrifice completed the sacrifices. No longer would there be a need for sacrifices. And when his work was done, when he said, Neg Mar, and he finished everything, and when he rose from the dead, he sat down at his father's right hand. And in the act of sitting down, it was symbolic of the fact that his work had been completed. His work of redemption had been accomplished for mankind. He finished what he had come to do on the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom plans of God had been made long before creation had ever been created. And so now Jesus' desire was really to eat this Passover meal with them. And he had come, he had finished it, he had completed it, and so now it was finished. The new covenant could begin. Amen. We're going to continue Luke 22 next week.